Welcome to A.T. Stewart and Sons Ministries. I'm your host, A.T. Stewart. I'm glad you've chosen to join us today as we look into the Word of God. So take your Bibles and let's hang out in God's Word for a few moments and see what God would say to us today. Take your Bibles and let's turn to Revelation chapter 3 if you've not already done so. While you're finding that, let me remind you that on Christmas Eve night we will not have services that evening. So you can spend time with your families. We will have service that morning, but not that evening. How can you tell if a church is spiritually alive or not? Say you move to a new town, and you're looking for a church. What would you look for in a church to determine if that church was spiritually alive or not? Now you are visiting around different churches. You go in. What do you look for? What are some of the things that you think a spiritual life church should have? Now, if you're like most people, you will be thinking, well, let's see. I would ex- look for a church that has enthusiastic services. A church that is exciting. I can just feel the air of excitement when I go in. I look for a church that has growing attendance. They have an additions on a regular basis. I look for a church that had large offerings where the people were great givers. You might say, well, I think I'd look for a church where they had great sermons. Surely a spiritual life church would have great sermons. And by great sermons, most people mean they're interesting, they're humorous, and they're not too long. You say, well, I think it also a uh, spiritual life church have a lot of young people. Look around, see a lot of young people. I expect a large choir. I expect nice buildings, probably a bus ministry, programs for all age groups, for children, for singles, for uh, senior adults. And I expect the people to be friendly. And so you, if you're like most people, would look for these things in a spiritually alive church. Well, then you got to think, well, what about a spiritually dead church? How could I tell if I was in one of those? And you might have a list and say, well, there would be probably a decrease in attendance. People would be leaving the church. Uh, there'd probably be financial crisis in the church, uh, probably boring sermons, you know. By that meaning uh, the preacher was maybe giving more truth than you wanted to listen to and preaching longer than you wanted, or he might just be boring. Uh, unfriendly people, you might think. Old buildings that were dilapidating, falling down. Very few programs for many people. Not many young people in the church, just mainly older people. And you might have this list, and you might say, now these are the vital signs of spiritual life. You know, we have physical vital signs that we go by. Uh, one of the things they look for to determine if somebody is alive or not is they look at the vital signs. And what do they mean by those? Well, they listen to see if the heart's beating. The heart's not beating. That's a good sign. There's no life there. Uh, they'll open the eyes, you remember, and shine a light to see if the pupils are responding to the light. Uh, they will check and see if the person is breathing. Uh, if they have a blood pressure cup available, they may take the blood pressure to see what the blood pressure is like. And by these things, they can physically determine if this person has life or not. Well, spiritually, there are also vital signs that we can take to tell if a person or a church is spiritually alive. But the things that I've given you a few moments ago are not the things that you can look at to determine if a church is spiritually alive. The truth is, none of those things, either the good or the bad things, show whether a church is either alive or dead spiritually. You see, it's like looking, it's looking at the wrong things to determine spiritual life. Looking at those things that I mentioned and trying to determine spiritual life by them is like trying to determine if somebody is physically alive or not by looking at their hair. Now, you could lay down two different bodies, one alive, one dead. You cover up everything except the tip of the head. And you could examine the hair, both of those bodies, and you could not determine if that body had life in it or not from the hair. Do you know that? In fact, hair even grows after a person dies. It continues to grow for a day or so. And so you can't determine. If a person's only been dead for five minutes, you cannot determine by looking at their hair if they're dead or not. 
You must look at the vital signs of heartbeat, if they're breathing. We're trying to look at these things that I mentioned earlier that most people look for when they look for a spiritual life in a church. It's trying to, like trying to look at your hair to determine if a person's alive or not. You can't do it. It's not a sign. It's not at all evidence if a church is alive or not. And the example is the church at Sardis, there in chapter 3 of Revelation. Now look what Jesus says to this church. And so our test tonight is the test of life, or you might say the test of genuineness. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, and you are dead. Now the church at Sardis had the name. Evidently, people of all ages have taken the list that I gave out and used that to determine if a church was alive or not. And Jesus said, "Uh uh-uh, that's not what you use to determine. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight is the deceptive mask of spiritual death. The deceptive mask of spiritual death. I walked in a hospital room one time, and as soon as I came in the door, the aroma of roses entered my olfactory nerves. And so I immediately looked where the odor was coming from and saw some beautiful roses over there uh, on the windowsill. So I walked over and and just looked like beautiful roses. So I leaned over. and Boy, they smell beautiful. So I reached out and touched them. And you know what I found out? They were velvet. They were artificial. They were not true at all. And they were very deceptive in their appearance. But you know the problem? I was looking at the wrong thing to determine life. I was going by the smell and the look. And they could look and smell like a rose and not be a rose at all. But it was the touch. And if I had not even been able to determine by touch, but I could have taken some of that rose petal and put it under a microscope, I could have quickly seen there were no living cells. There were no cells in that, in that velvet. But rather it was artificial. And so the mask of death can be very deceptive. Something can appear to be alive, but in reality, be dead. So it was the church at Sardis. First, their works. Their works. Jesus says, I know your deeds. And again, this was a working church. There were no lack of activities at this church. No question about it. There probably were programs for all ages. Big singles group, probably. Big young couples group, big senior citizen group. Probably had a large choir, but they were dead spiritually. You see, all the things that people normally look for to determine spiritual life are no sign at all of spiritual life. And that's what had happened to the church at Sardis. People looked at them. Man, they they are alive. Look, Look at all their works. But they were dead. You see, we think, man, if you have a lot of activities, a lot of things going on, that there must be spiritual life there. But you know, the boys club stays busy. They have a lot of activities over there. I don't call them a spiritually alive organization. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir can put on beautiful musical specials. I mean, they can r- hang right up there with any choirs in any churches in America as far as the beauty of their performances. But are you going to say there's spiritual life there? The Mormon church is, has no lack of growing attendance. I mean, they are one of the fastest growing churches in America and also in the world. But I'm sure I'm not going to attribute spiritual life to the Mormons. Service clubs help in the community, the Lions Club, the Rotary Club. They do great service in the community. But I'm not going to attribute spiritual life to them either. As far as excitement and enthusiasm... Rock concerts have all of that. Even some football games have a great bit of excitement to them. But that doesn't mean there's spiritual life there. Yeah, we think, boy, if a church has excitement, and if we go in and there's a lot of a musical excitement, you know, that's one of the best ways to work up excitement is music. I don't guess there's anything that can stir the chords of the soul like music can, is it? Man, one of those John Philip Sousa marching. I just want to march every time I hear one of those, don't you? You just can't help but your foot at least pats if you don't just start marching. It just stirs something up within you. How about the Star Spangled Banner? 
I mean, how many of us during the Olympics can can listen to the Star Spangled Banner being played and see our American on the highest pedal of the podium, highest pedestal of the podium, having won the gold medal? How many of you keep a dry eye when you hear that Star Spangled Banner? I can't. My eyes tear up every time. And so if you want to create an excitement, man, have exciting music. But that doesn't mean there's spiritual life there at all. The rock concerts, again, prime example. But that's why people enjoy those rock concerts so much. That's why some of them will pay $25, $50 a ticket. You paid me $50, I wouldn't go to most of them. And yet people will pay $50 or more to go because they like the excitement. Right? We like to be excited. That doesn't show. Same thing about drawing large crowds. I mean, you could pack out an auditorium. Omni packed out. That group that played down here a few weeks ago that they made such a big noise about that's been around for so many years. I didn't like them when I was growing up, and I still don't care for them now. In fact, I can't even pull the name right out of the top of my But you know the group I'm talking about. But Rolling Stones, yeah, I didn't care about them back when I was growing up. Don't care about them now, but folks packed $100, $200 a ticket some people paid, I understand. Cause excitement. Draw the big crowds, but there's no spiritual life there. You see, these are not signs of spiritual life. We need to understand that. Because we're not careful. We look at a church that has these things and we think, well, man, boy, that, that must really be alive over there. But is it? And if you're visiting a new community trying to find a church, just because it has these things, don't you immediately say, well, man, that church is really alive. Sardis had great deeds. Look at their reputation. Verse 1 again. That you have a name that you are alive. Boy, they had a name of being a live church. The church people talked about. If it was this day and time, the pastor of Sardis would probably go around to other churches and talk about church growth and hold church growth, growth conferences and talk about how to grow a great church. Now, that's what we do now. We find a guy that's got a lot of people joining his church and a lot of things seem to be happening and he becomes an authority and the convention pays for him to go around to all these other churches and talk about how his church got so great. He becomes a gro church growth consultant. And if we had been back in those days like they are today, then the pastor of Sardis would have made his rounds telling all the churches, boy, our church, look at it. And they said, yeah, man, your church is alive. It had a name for being a good church. I mean, nothing's mentioned about Balaam. Nothing's mentioned about Jezebel. There's no immorality mentioned. There's no worldliness mentioned. These were good, upstanding people. They could have been the first Baptist church of any town. I mean, good folk. But you know the problem is they were good, but they were not godly. You see, Sardis had a name with men, but they did not have a name with God. You see, Jesus saw some things that men did not see in Sardis. The first thing Jesus saw, he saw their spiritual drowsiness. Their spiritual drowsiness. Verse 2, Jesus says, wake up. Wake up. Now, have you ever thought about who you say wake up to? Now, you say wake up to somebody who's asleep or somebody who's, who's uh, uh, kind of dozing off on you, right? I mean, you wouldn't go up to, again, going back to the Olympics, you wouldn't go up to one of the 100-meter the, uh, 100, 100 dash runners who was there waiting at the starting line with his muscles all tense, waiting for the sounding of the starting gun. You wouldn't walk up to him and say, wake up, wake up. And he is awake. He's ready. He's pensively waiting for the start that he can put everything into the first step. No, you go over there to the guy who's laying over there in the stands, dozing, and you say, hey, wake up. You're about to miss this race. Wake up. And so when Jesus tells this church, wake up, he's telling me that he sees a spiritual drowsiness. They're in a spiritual stupor. In fact, it's the same term Jesus used with his disciples when he told them about his second coming. He said, now be alert, be expectant, get spiritually sensitive, get spiritually awake. You use this to talk to people who are out of tune with what's going on spiritually. And you tell them, hey, you need to get in tune with what God's doing. You need to get in step with God. You're out of step with what God is doing in this situation. You've become spiritually lazy. You're just going through the motions. You need to get spiritually tuned with Christ. You're not spiritually minded as you need to be. You're playing church rather than being the church. 
And I think the church at Sardis had fallen into this very problem. They'd gotten so spiritually drowsy and in such a spiritual stupor, they were out of touch with what Christ was doing at all. They thought, man, we got the activities, we've got the programs, we've got the choirs. Everybody in the community thinks, man, this church is on fire for Jesus. And so they figured, hey, we on fire for Jesus. And Jesus said, ah, you've missed it. You're spiritually asleep. You're spiritually unconscious. You're in a coma spiritually. Now wake up. Get in tune with me. You have missed me altogether. It may well be that they had gotten program-minded as opposed to being spiritually minded. You see, that's possible for churches to do that. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, it's easy for a church to get program-minded rather than spiritually minded. They think, well, now, we've got to have a program to fix this problem here, fix this problem there. Well, we realize, you know, we just don't have a, uh, enough young couples coming to our church. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's come up with a program that will appeal to the young couples. Let's come up with a program that deals with child training, and we'll publicize this all over the community, and, and maybe we can and interest some of them, and maybe we can get something going there. Or maybe we don't have no senior adults coming. We need to get some recreation activities going so we can get more senior adults coming to the church. And so we try to find a program to plug in. You know, it reminds me a lot of, of these television repairmen now that everything has gone transistor and everything is kind of on a board, you know. And a lot of times they can just unplug something and plug something else in and it works. And they just got to find out what's not working and then they can plug the right thing in and it starts working again. It's kind of like I see a lot of churches doing. You know, there's a problem and they're trying to figure out now what program can we plug in over here to make this thing work, rather than being spiritually minded. I'll tell you another, another thing that I, I believe churches are out of step with God about, and that is the idea that bigger is better. Bigger is better. There's a church in our Southern Baptist Convention that uh, has just moved into a brand new building. They moved out from downtown out to the uh, another part of town. They call it Canaan. And they've been moving into this thing for about two years, getting ready, building up, uh, paying for the building. And they built an auditorium that would seat 7,000 people. 13 acres of carpet in the building itself. And that's not just auditorium, but the whole building. 13 acres of carpet. Now, I'm just wondering, is Christ up in heaven clapping, saying, man, that is wonderful. I finally got a church down here that can seat 7,000 folks. You know, I just got to believe that we're out of tune with God when it comes to the idea that bigger is better. I mean, why not start other churches rather than just keep trying to get one bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? And I don't know what the place is that you say, okay, we're big enough, let's start a new church. I don't have any magic formula. But I got a feeling 7,000 is too far. Now, you know, I started thinking, what can a big church offer that a small church cannot offer? You know, if it's some valid things that a big church can offer that a small church can't offer, then maybe we can say, hey, Christ does want us to have bigger is better. So I said, well, what about Bible teaching? Can a big church offer better Bible teaching than a small church? No. Because one thing, large classes are not best. A class of anywhere from 10 to 20 people is as big as you need. So you don't need a big church. You don't need to have big Sunday school classes. And as far as teachers, you can have just as good Bible teachers in a small church as you can a big church, right? So can't offer better Bible teaching. Well, what about a discipleship? Can they offer better discipleship? No. They can disciple, but a small church can offer discipleship training just as much so. Well... What about programs? You say, well, you know, we went to this church because there were so many young adult couples our age. And that man, we just felt right at home there because man, they even grouped us into how long we've been married. Those people been married three months in this class, and those people been married six months in this class, and those people been married a year in this class. Now, you folks are laughing, but there are churches that do that. And man, we just like that because there are so many people our age. Well, now, Tell me, where, did the, where does the Scripture ever say we ought to group people by age group? You don't find anywhere in Scripture where Sunday school, or even church service, of course, 
divides people by age groups. You don't find it. You don't find in Scripture where children are broken up into age groups, the way we educate them. You know, we think, oh, but they won't be socialized if they're not with people their own age. Now, the Scripture doesn't say that. If it was necessary for children to be around people their own age in order to be socialized, did you know God would have everybody born as least twins or triplets? Right? But you don't find that in the family. What do you find? You find everybody a different age group in families. And that's where God intends for us to be socialized, in families with different age groups. Most of the time what happens when you group kids the same age together is they just get a little more wilder and a little wilder, you see. Just feed into each other. And we think, though, but, oh, but you can't learn if they're senior adults and then middle-aged adults and young adults in the same class. You can't learn. The Scripture never says you can't. The Bible never says you ought to be with people exactly your own age who've been married exactly the same length time you have. Not at all. So I don't think that's really an advantage that a larger church can offer either. Well, you say, what can they offer? You know, there's one thing I came to they could offer a small church couldn't offer. And that is not as well anyway. Entertainment. Bless goodness, you just can't have as big a choir as in a small church as you can have as a big church. You just can't have the orchestra in a small church that you can have in a big church. I mean, you cannot put on the production in a small church that you can put on in a big church. I mean, I saw a church on television the other day, First Baptist Church of Jackson, Mississippi, and man, they had about eight or nine guys with these trumpets that had to be this long, you know, those long old trumpets like you see in the Middle Age movies. And boy, they were blowing those trumpets from the balcony. And then they must have had a hundred people in the choir. And then had an orchestra down front. And I mean, they were having one good time. One good time. Now, you can't find that in a smaller church, I'll agree. But again, I'm not at all convinced that God wants that either. I'm not convinced that that is where the Spirit of God is. And so I think we need to rethink, churches need to rethink the idea of bigger is better. And we need to say, is this really what God wants us to do? Jesus said to the church at Sardis, wake up. Get in tune with me. You're out doing your own thing and you need to be back in touch with me. Second thing Jesus says to them, he talks about their spiritual emptiness. Verse 2, wake up. Strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. And he says their deeds were not completed, meaning they have not been fulfilled. It means that their deeds were empty. You see, this church at best was shallow spiritually. I mean, the best that they had was a spiritual shallowness. Their deeds were like an empty shell. They did not fulfill God's purposes. Their works were void of spiritual power and life. Now, to everybody else, they looked good. But to God, they were nothing. How we look to God counts much more than how we look to men. You see, a church can look great to men, but be nothing in God's sight. And that was the problem with the church at Sardis. Oh, they were praised by men. But Jesus says you're dead spiritually. Now let's look at the signs of a spiritually alive church. What are the things you can look for in a church to tell if it's spiritually alive? I'm going to give you a few things. I don't say this is an exhaustive list by any means, but I think you will find these in a church that's spiritually alive. First, the Holy Spirit is recognized and depended upon. The Holy Spirit is recognized and depended upon. You see, a spiritually alive church is not dependent on programs. They are dependent on the Holy Spirit. They don't think, well, now we got a problem here. Let's call up to Nashville and see what kind of program we can get to solve that problem. They think, hey, we got a problem. Let's go to our knees and seek God for an answer. Let's see what the Spirit of God can do and wants to do in this situation. The church depends upon the Holy Spirit to do the work of God, not some program that man can come up with or some gimmick that man can do. God says it's not by power or by might, but by my Spirit that my will is accomplished. There is not a reliance upon fleshly efforts and gimmicks to accomplish the work of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
And when a church falls into the trap of fleshly efforts, thinking, now, what kind of gimmick, what can we do to solve this problem? What can we do to take care of this? And they do everything out of the energy of the flesh, as I believe Sardis had fallen into that trap, then all the flesh will ever give forth is flesh. That which is born of the flesh, that which uses the means of the flesh, will only give flesh. That which is born of the Spirit of God, that will bring forth spirit and life. And so a church may have a great number of activities, great number of programs, great excitement and all this stuff, but if they're not depending upon the Spirit of God, they're not a church that's spiritually alive. Secondly, as an obedience to God's Word, as an obedience to God's Word, The Word of God is the standard by which everything is tested. They test their programs by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God. They test the services. They test the activities. Everything is tested by the Word of God. And if it doesn't measure up, hey, let's can it. Let's get rid of it. It needs to follow God's Word. There is an obedience to God's Word in witnessing. They will go out and witness in obedience. There's an obedience in giving, in praying, in teaching, in preaching. In equipping the saints, they will be an obeying church. I don't know how any church can be spiritually alive if the Word of God is not taught and preached. Thirdly, there will be persecution. They will not be praised by men and by the world, but rather they will be a persecuted lot. Jesus said all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will experience persecution. And if a church has a reputation among men, I think they better be leery and say, now, wait, wait, wait a minute here. Now, this community thinks too well of us. We, we better watch ourselves because the world didn't think well of our Lord. And he said they wouldn't think well of us. Number four, the primary goal is to glorify God, not man. The primary goal is to glorify God, not man. Some big churches, and this is, can also be true of small churches, you get the idea that the man is being glorified, not God. In fact, some of the books I've read on church growth, one of the things that they say is if you're really going to have a growing church, you need to have a very strong personality for a pastor. And you need to build the church around the man. I've read things like that. And I think that is just, not from God at all. I mean, that's not what I read in the Scriptures, that we want to build any church around any man. It's to be built around Christ, but that's what they tell you. Build a church around that strong personality. And you think about some of these larger churches in America today that you know about, and what comes to mind? Pastor of the church. He's the one you always hear about. He's the one you always see. Uh, He's the one that's always on the advertisements. Steve and I get a newsletter Uh, At least I get it, and I share it with Steve sometimes from one of the larger churches in our Southern Baptist Convention out in California. And sometimes we just have a great laugh at looking at how many times the pastor's picture shows up in the newsletter. And one time, it's about a three or four-page newsletter, and one time his picture had to have been in that four times. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Uh, Of course, they've got a theater, and one, one... time they had this group come come to sing. It looked like they were from Las Vegas. I mean, you would not believe. It looked like showgirls uh, and dressed like it. And I couldn't believe it. What is the church of Jesus Christ come to when to try to bring the world in, they bring the world into the church and try to track the world that way. But it, it would have appalled you to have seen the picture uh, that we saw. But you get an idea they're trying to glorify man rather than God. A church is spiritually alive will desire to glorify her Lord and Master. Not some man or group. Number five, I think a sign of spiritual life in a church is that God's order is followed. God's ordained order is recognized and it's followed. As sovereign Lord, he has set forth his order and his design for the home and for the church. And it is to be followed and a spiritually alive church will recognize and follow God's order. Now what are the steps to life? How can a person who is... Spiritually in a coma, not dead yet, because if you're ever born again, you never die. But, man, you maybe you can lapse into a coma spiritually, in a spiritual stupor. How can a person or a church who is on the verge of spiritual death bring back 
to life. Well, let's look and see what Jesus says. He gives some steps. Number one, I believe recognize and depend upon the Holy Spirit. Recognize and depend upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives the answer, the cure, to their spiritual deadness before he even talks about the problem. Look at how he describes himself in verse 1. He who has the seven spirits of God. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. That clover that Bill showed us didn't have uh, ten leaves on ten leaves on it. It just had three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now you're saying that seven spirits? By seven, it means the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's only one Holy Spirit, but by seven, the word, the number that represents fullness, John is talking about, or Jesus is talking about, the diversity of the Holy Spirit and His fullness. It is the Spirit Himself that imparts life. It is the Spirit Himself that maintains life. And if a church or an individual is going to walk in the fullness of God's life, they must walk in the fullness of God's Spirit as we lean upon and depend upon the Spirit of God. Second step. Remember the importance of faith and obedience. Look in verse 3. Jesus says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Now, if you've got the New American Standard, it's got what you have received and heard, but that's not what the Greek says. The Greek says how. How you have. There's a lot of difference between what you received and how you received it. Now, I don't know why the translators took the liberty to change that word, but it's literally the word how. And that's a lot of difference. Therefore, remember how you have received and heard. How did they receive and heard? They received the truth about God. They received Christ through faith and obedience. That's what he's saying. He's saying, remember the importance of faith and obedience. Remember how you received Christ through faith. Now, remember this. They'd forgotten that faith and obedience are fundamental in the Christian walk. They'd forgotten that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And they'd gotten into just the fleshly efforts, trying to accomplish the will of God through the flesh, rather than through faith. So remember the importance of faith and obedience. Number three, they must keep this truth ever before them. Jesus says, remember therefore how you have received and heard and keep it. Keep this truth before you. They began their Christian life in faith. They must continue to live the Christian life by faith. Same thing Paul told the church at Galatia. You all been studying that in Sunday school. Paul said, who bewitched you? How did you receive the Spirit? Let me ask you. Did you receive the Spirit of God through faith or through works of the law? Well, they said, well, well, through faith. He said, all right, then why are you trying to be perfected through the law? Why are you trying to grow into spiritual maturity through the law then? Faith is the way. The faith that leads to obedience, that's the way to grow in spiritual maturity. And this is what Jesus is saying to this church in Sardis. He said, now wait a minute, you've forgotten the importance of faith and obedience. You're trying to flesh this thing out. You're trying to do God's work through fleshly efforts to, through human engineering rather than through trusting the Spirit of God and moving out in obedience, trusting that Spirit to work through you. And then he says, fourthly, repent. Change their view. That activity equals spiritual life. Change your view that you think you're so active and involved that you're really alive, but you're not. Realize that true spiritual life cannot be judged by activity because you can have works and not have faith. A true spiritual faith will produce works, but you can have the works and still be spiritually dead. I believe every church should take stock and ask this question. What are we doing that we could not do without the Holy Spirit? What are we doing that we could not do without the Holy Spirit? Somebody has said the Holy Spirit could leave most Baptist churches and they wouldn't know it for six months because the programs would just keep going. They'd probably add a few more programs if the Spirit left, because that's usually what we do. When the Spirit's not there, we have to make up with our own efforts to try to accomplish what only the Spirit can accomplish. And so we add a program. We must never think because there are activities, there are, there are spiritual things occurring. Those are the steps to life. Now look at Christ's promises. 
in verse 5. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, clothed in white robes, white a symbol of purity and righteousness. Spoken of in chapter 7 of Revelation, of those who've been washed by the blood of the Lamb have white robes. He says in verse 4, there are a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, have not gotten into sin. Therefore, they walk with him in righteousness, and they're worthy. God maintains his remnant in every group that are his. And so he says, those who overcome, those who persevere in their faithfulness, those who walk by faith, not in fleshly efforts, those who remember how they received and repent, To those, he says, you shall be clothed in my righteousness. Secondly, he says, her names will be in the book of life. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. Those who've trusted Christ and truly love him will be in the book. And that's more important than your name being on church roll. I'm afraid there were a number of people in Sardis whose names were on the church roll, but they were not. On God's road, the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, some people have read this and say, well, that means you can lose your salvation. No, Jesus never says that. He uses this to affirm the fact that he will not erase their name, that they are his. He doesn't ever say he erased anybody's name. He simply is saying as they are faithful, they can be assured that their salvation will continue. And then thirdly, he says, And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Won't that be a great day? When you have maintained your walk with the Lord through his grace, and the Lord Jesus confesses your name before the Father and his holy angels. Can you picture the scene? There you are, standing before God and the angels of glory. And the Lord Jesus says, Father... I want to present to you, and then he says your name, who has maintained his walk or her walk with you in faith and obedience. And all of heaven hears your name presented. He confessed me before men. Father, I confess him before you and your angels. Won't all the persecution be worth it then? Hmm? Won't all the hardships and adversity be worth it then? To know that the Father will hear your name on the lips of the Lord Jesus as he confesses you before the Father. What about your spiritual condition tonight? Are you spiritually alive on fire for Jesus? The same test of the church or a test of the individual? Are you in a spiritual coma? (laughs) Have you lapsed because you've been not fed yourself spiritually into spiritual anemia? And even into a coma spiritually, do you need to wake up? Have you been trying to flesh out this Christian walk rather than trusting the Spirit of God and by obedience moving out and letting Him work in you? Have you been trying to do it all yourself? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You need to repent and remember how you received Him through faith and walk again by faith. Or perhaps you're not spiritually alive at all, but you're dead you've never come into life, never been born of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has done a work in your life and He stirred within you a hunger, a desire to be right with God. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond in faith and obedience tonight. Receive Him as your Lord and Savior as you call upon Him to save you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your Spirit would do your work in our lives this night you would test each of us to show us if we pass the test of life. In Jesus' name, amen. 198, our hymn of response, stand and sing. Step out on the first stanza, 198.